Cool. I think we'll kick things off. Uh, hope. Um, so my name is Rohit Biju. I'm one of the organizers of Crypto Mondays London. Um, and so we've been running this academy session now just just for over a few weeks. Uh, so the main aim of the academy session is to kind of introduce people um, to the various topics that we have in our IRL events. So our next IRL, uh, IRL event will be next Monday. Um, so I kind of learn um, using the academy session and then come with questions and interact more um, with our academy, um, sorry, with our IRL event. Um, so for those of you who don't know Crypto Mondays, uh, we've been established since 2018 here in UK. Um, we have done many events uh, since then. Um, so the UK um, initiative was founded by Caitlin and Larry um, in February 2018. And with the whole aim of providing a fun, interactive, um, educational space where people can come um, and that's what uh, we've been doing so far. Um, and we have since then grown and we have over 4,000 members in our meetup community and we're still growing. So for those who have um, who have come to our events, uh, just want to say thank you for your support. Um, and if you are new here, um, please use the QR, um, QR code on the screen to kind of um, join our community um, in whatever social media platform that um, you're active in and do keep an eye out for all our future events and also join us um, in our social media also. So the Crypto Academy session is also recorded um, and is posted on our YouTube channel, which you can find from our um, using the QR code. So if you do you guys want to have watch back or anything, um, please join our YouTube channel also. Just having some technical issues. Wait one second. So uh, today's we just want to say a big thank you to our today, um, the Academy sponsor today, who is Wasim from Walk 12. So Walk 12 has been our sponsor for the Academy sessions over the past few weeks. Um, and I would like to invite Wasim um, to introduce himself and also what Walk 12 um, does in the crypto space. So Wasim, if you can uh, come hey, on board. Thanks so much, Roy. Uh, my name is Wasim Ahmad. I'm with Walt 12. Um, what we do is very simple. We enable you to create a legacy contact for your crypto wallet. So all of the crypto assets, whether they're NFTs or cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., cetera, um, making sure, giving you a way to make sure that those assets can be inherited uh, by your beneficiaries. So a very simple app. It's on the App Store. We have 300,000 customers and... Um, I am looking forward to seeing everyone in person next week in London. Thank you, we'll see. You. So uh, if you guys want to check out what all talk does, I will leave a QR code here. So please feel free to go check out what they do. And also, if you're free next week on a Monday, pop in and speak to Basim if you have any questions or um, any opportunities where you guys can work together. Thank you, Basim, for that. Uh, we also want to say a big thank you to our IRL event sponsor, um, our sponsors for our IRL events, BitGet, Economy, Kudos, Walt 12, Digital Commonwealth, Jade City, Shine, and Voice of Crypto. Uh, without them, we won't exist. So just want to say a massive thank you for all their support. And also, uh, once again, feel free you know, if you haven't joined, feel free to join our community. That's where we post all our events and our upcoming events as well.
And if you do have a, um, we also have not here to um, leave a feedback after the event on how we can make this academy sessions better going forward. And if you have any specific tricks that you want to hear about as well, include that to our geek of the day, um, who is Tatiana, to Tatiana, who will give us a brief introduction. And kick us off with today's academy session i also want to say and um hopefully we'll have some q and a session uh, towards the end um where tatiana can help us out. i'd like to welcome tatiana um can you hi hear me? everyone lovely to meet you perfect so i'll let you share your screen tatiana and then oh i haven't prepared that i thought you would be sharing do you mind one second. Otherwise, let me know and I'll change um, computers. Yep, that's fine. Let me just uh, share a screen. Do let me know if uh, we can see. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Um, as Rohit mentioned, my name is Tatiana. I have a bit of a different background. I believe it's a bit all over the place. Um, and the reason being, I took my 20s to try and understand what different aspects of finance I wanted to do and see different industries from the back end and understand them and speak to people. So I started my career in crowdfunding for about two years at a company called Crowd2Fund, the first one to get an innovative finance ISA approval by the FCA back in 2016 um, when the, well, there wasn't a lot of blending going on. And we were part of this uh, funding team that was helping to do bridges with the US and um, looking at Australia and doing FinTech bridges with Singapore. So it was a very exciting time. It was very, um, yeah, just, just kind of a bit like the Web3 space, lots of movements, lots of speaking to banks and understanding where the gaps in knowledge were. Um, turns out a lot in terms of tech, depending on who you spoke to, of course. And then moved to uh, payments consulting, uh, focusing sorely on uh, like sh solely on payments. Um, and again, with the focus on fintech, uh, before moving into Deloitte, where I was working in M&A tech due diligence for about two years, after which I jumped into the exciting world of VC in the Web3 space. Um, I was brought on board to do to focus on gaming and then obviously as uh, any of you know who are in that sector uh, that didn't go so well so we pivoted a few times and we primarily focused on infrastructure deals and I myself was looking a little bit more at LATAM uh, because I am half South American so for me that was quite interesting seeing what the Solana team and other teams are doing in the space, um, how different people are growing, again, with the FinTech angle and a lot of parallels within that. So after that, so the last few months, I've been freelancing and potentially as this uh, chat might suggest, I help uh, founders who are looking to fundraise by getting them, coaching them a little bit on the behind the scenes of what happens, at least at our VC and what I heard from some of the VCs, again, not everyone's the same. Some are different, <laughs> and there is a plethora of reasons for that. Um, and focusing more on developing the materials. So if we go on to the next slide. Rohit, sorry, can we go to the next slide, please? Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. I think he's dropped off. Right. Well, um, I'll just go through it, but it's <laughs> it'll be easier. Maybe we can share these afterwards. 
Um, I think the first thing to start off with that I wanted to start off with is the why, the reasons why um, the VCs, venture capitalists exists. Um, let's be honest, there's two reasons. The only reason is to make more money. So if you come to them with a project, you need to make sure that your project sells to them how they're going to make money. Um, these are people that have either fundraised from LPs, which are private individuals, high net worth, ultra high net worth, family offices, et cetera. This is not PE, which is at a different level, which will be looking at larger companies, different organizations. VCs are very much pool of money looking to invest and get a return within a shorter time frame than most uh, PE houses and with a lot less, um, usually a lot less um, personal investments. So, and by personal investments, I mean, there's not a lot of hand holding. Some may help you quite a bit. Others will just leave you to it. So the first type of investment you might get is angel investments. Um, people that are just going to give you money because they believe in your idea, family members, friends, um, you know, Kickstarter campaigns. It really depends on what you're going for and where you're fundraising. Not everyone does an angel round. Uh, some people do, some people don't. Angel rounds might also include your own money. Um, there are also incubators. So again, incubators are the in-between angel sometimes and um, any venture capital. And what they do is, as the name suggests, they take your project, you'll stay within them, they'll help you grow, they'll take some equity, they'll put you in touch with the right people. They'll, and that includes either money or that includes help to structure projects, get you the regulatory requirements, really just mature it until it's ready to actually become a minimum viable product. So it's, it's quite early stage most of the time. An accelerator, by contrast, is once you've got the idea, once you've got a minimum viable product, once you have a team, once you've got the right bones to it, you go to the accelerator. Again, as the name suggests, you'll be put through quite a rigorous training process within a usually three month time frame to make sure that then at the end of it, they will bring in their investor pool. They will also get equity and then they'll make sure that you accelerate literally oh, wow. through either financial investments or via um, introductions to potential partnerships, uh, potential sales, potential customers. So again, accelerates your growth. VC, on the other hand, tends to come in at pre-seed at the same level as an accelerator. Sometimes they work hand in hand. And venture capitalists, again, I'll, I'll dive into this a little bit later at how, what you need to present to them is you need to understand their goal isn't to help you grow. It is to help them make money for their LPs, their, their, their investors. So they'll be very interested in what you have. They'll be very interested in the market. They'll see the potentials. But you do have to come with them with the understanding that they might offer to help and they will, many of them will. But again, remember their first job is to scout for investments and they'll invest in a way that, you know, for every 10, one of them will become a unicorn. And that's the way that they will be investing that. Private capital, I've put it in here because it kind of captures private equity, which again, it's a little, usually a, a later stages of growth, um, but it is, investment that sometimes is in from a VC. If you have somebody that comes through to you directly at any of the stages and says, this is a check, that is private capital. It hasn't come from an institution like a venture capital fund, which is structured. It's come directly from a person's pocket. Um, obviously I have to include crowdfunding because it's a personal favorite. It's where I started my career. Different types of crowdfunding, depending on where you are on your career, Kickstarter, which is basically um, quid pro quo in materials or product, depending on how much you invest. Equity, uh, lending, bonds, less common, and charity. So again, crowdfunding platforms for equity include Cedars, which is very early stage. Um, you get Crowdcube, which is a little bit further down the line, um, but you do have to do a lot of the work yourself. Uh, for anyone crowdfunding, usually I would aim for Free crowdsourcing 80% minimum. Usually you try to do 120% commit before you go live. The platforms will always tell you that they will help, but it's very difficult when you see other projects to drive people to invest on a crowdfunding platform. So you have to do a lot of the marketing yourself and get people excited to invest and ready to invest. Um, if you want to ask for 
afterwards for examples of really successful crowdfunding campaigns let me know i can show you point you to a few which crowdfunded in hours sometimes minutes um, because they did a really great marketing campaign and had a great team behind them not only team working but also team in terms of people who have bought into the idea so again the why when you approach a vc you need to, or any of them you need to understand what's their thesis and by thesis why would they invest in you do you relate to any of the companies that they've helped grow maybe you know if you look at barclays barclays sometimes has a little bit rise accelerator they're a little bit more focused on fintech things that are financially related again blockchain so you may if you're doing something that's maybe not within that parameter you won't get as much interest but again since we're crypto mondays it'll always be um, relevant to somebody like Rise. It does get particular when you like uh, when you approach someone that maybe doesn't invest on the B2B SaaS platforms, but invest maybe in infrastructure. So you have to understand, are you approaching the right investors or are you wasting your time doing five hours of calls with five different investors when you've actually not understood that their investment thesis is maybe they're looking to understand what you're doing. They're interested, but it's not quite within their parameters of the original investment thesis. So it's really important to do your own homework and due diligence on the VCs. And that will really just streamline how you approach them, what kind of information they might like, who might do a, a correct introduction. But I'll, I'll get back to that again later on. So the, my last point, how that investment aligns with you. Again, really important. If you're looking for money, it doesn't really matter which VC gives it to you, so long as they're not going to get too involved, depending on the size of the check. If you are looking for a VC to help you and to do introductions, you, again, need to do your own due diligence. That that VC, the way that they work, their why is, why do they want to invest in you? Do they want you to partner with their companies? Do they want to see you grow because they're excited? They're genuinely looking to, like, work within the space. You know, maybe they've made a lot of money and they just kind of miss being at work but don't want a, a full-time job so they might help you more or is it a pure vc where they're just you know looking at deals they're going to get you through they might answer they may not might take weeks for them to get back to you and if you're expecting them to be an active partner in your growth you really do have to consider what you want from the vc and whether or not they might actually um be there for you in that sense so if we go on to the next slide i think this kind of encapsulates what I think the VC and funding journey is. So I think there's different ways and different people who have said this, but hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and be surprised by anything in between. Hopefully it's a happy surprise. Go in, the, the fundraising process is long. Some of them, if it's AI, will be sometimes days, weeks. Um, if it's anything else, it might take months. You might have to do a lot of educating of your VCs because of, for different reasons, educating because your product is maybe a little bit more complicated or educating because that VC is interested in you and the project, but is still unsure of the market itself. So they watch you grow for a few months and keep in touch and keep you warm. I think in dating, it's called breadcrumbing. <laughs> but with this one, you really do have to prepare. You have to prepare and make sure that you have the right um, information ready, that you have any questions that the VCs might, might have ready, that you might have any worst case scenarios ready. Because at the end of the day, the more homework you can do for the VC, the more you can say, look, I've done the heavy lifting for you. Please double check my homework and you know do whatever else you need to do in behind the scenes. The less they have to do themselves, which means that they are less likely to have to research, understand your market, understand specifically how you're going to go. So this will go for specifically to my next slide. So if you go to the next slide, please. So I think my internet's been bugging out a little bit. So just bear with me one second. No worries. So if next slide, perfect. So again, so preparing for the worst but hoping for the best, hoping that, you know, if somebody's nice, they'll give you the money immediately. But at Pre-Seed, some of the things that you might start understand, uh, wanting to be seen from VCs, um, back in the day when I started, not that long ago, two and a half years ago, 
people did not need an MVP. You kind of just needed a slide, a bit of a team, some sort of background and some sort of connections in the space to say, look, this is my idea. This is what I'm thinking. Let's get money. That was all it took. In the last few years, with everything that's crashed, with the well, what everything that we've all seen happen or not, and if you haven't, I won't scare you off. So <laughs> I'll keep keep it quiet. But in essence, now most people at Preseed want to see some sort of minimum viable products. What does that mean? It means that you've you've put pen to paper, you've got the coding down. There is something that works, even if it's clunky, even if the color scheme's wrong. Something that you can start selling to potential clients. And that means that I haven't included it here, but either you have to invest your own money to get the right team to do this, or you have to do seed fund, uh, fundraising. Seed fundraising, as I mentioned before, going to your friends, going to your colleagues, going to anyone um, who might want to invest at a very early stage where it's literally just an idea and you just need to say, look, do you believe in me? Yes or no? The answer is yes. This is the bank account. Please send it through. I will, you know, send you the share agreements and or convert it at a later stage. You know, if you want a later stage conversion and they're okay with that, then you can do that as well. Um, again, I think um, I can't remember if Cedars allows you to do that if you don't want to do the structuring yourself or get a lawyer to do it. So there are some platforms that might enable you to do this. Um, so do have a look around. At a pre-seed, so minimum viable products, the team's really important here. Um, you need to make sure that your team tells them, I think at a minimum three things, the CEO or is, is somebody that knows how to deliver. You've either done that at your previous jobs, you've done that at a previous, you know, um, company. And st second, you need someone that knows how to sale, sell, sorry. You should, obviously in the crypto space, you can outsource it, but you should have someone depending on how technical your product is, who is in-house as a developer specific to what you need. I remember we saw somebody who had outsourced most of their work for a metaverse platform. And one of the reasons we didn't invest wasn't because we didn't believe the team, we believed the team, we believed everything. They had you know, amazing um, companies behind them that were looking to adopt. They had an amazing runway, but no one on the team had technology specific um, background that made made us kind of like comfortable enough that we could invest because they knew what they were doing in terms of the development. The metaverse is an incredibly specific space. There is so much evolving. Um, there are so much requirements to do, you know, plugins with the different clients worldwide. How do you, you know, how are you controlling the access to the metaverse? How are you controlling the access to the developments of the games within it? How are you controlling in the back end that, you know, clients are accessing? So because it was a very complicated and very tech focused thing we needed to see someone on the team that was specific to either running uh, one of the game modules that they needed to you know create the metaverse itself but then also one of the team members to create the back end platform with that specific tech and whilst the team had done two years of training it wasn't the same as having somebody full-time that you really knew this so again your team is incredibly important and if you don't have somebody that wants to work full-time for you you need to make sure that you have advisors, one that are genuinely going to help you. And by that, I mean, we've seen advisors where the advisors were incredible, really important people in the industry, but we knew that they were at least on so many other boards and, and, VC, and you know, VCs and doing their own thing. We knew that they were impossible, that they were genuinely going to advise because their time was so precious. So if you're going to have an advisor, we also need to confirm that they're an advisor, usually as a VC. So some may ask to speak to the advisors. Now, a word of caution, and, and this is me being, pardon my French, but a bit bitchy. Some VCs will potentially use that as an access point to speak to somebody if they're high net worth, if they're difficult to get your, their hands on. So again, this is kind of, I, I think it's quite obvious and I'm sure none of you would do this, but do be careful who you're introducing them to. Just keep it to like you're really, important VCs where you really just want to convert them because you know that they're genuinely going to help. They've been in the space for a long time. They're not going to screw you around or your advisors around. Um, so again, team, really important. Get that in. Sometimes if you really need to, I've seen sometimes uh, VCs where 
the team, sorry, uh, uh, projects where the team wasn't really highlighting their skills that were relevant to that particular project. If you don't want your slides to get too messy because you have too, team, too many team members, slap in another deck with a team specific, like that's just team specific adds, the best thing you can do is add what targets have you hit? What kind of other KPIs can you share that are relevant to this? Not in the space, amazing, blah, blah, blah holds this NFT, I'm like, great, that doesn't mean anything to me. Genuinely, what have you done? How much have you converted? What are your sales look like? How have you executed? Give me like that because make me feel comfortable that I know or make your LinkedIn amazing. So in case I do look at it, it's not just worked in business sales in so-and-so place or developed X, Y, and Z platform. Like really give me, sell me yourself. Like tell me how you hit these targets. I can give you the money so that you can hit the targets too. Uh, go to market. So the next slide for the pre-seed again, something you didn't really need anymore, but there were so many losses because people didn't really understand what they were doing. They had a great idea, really fun and enthusiastic team, but just genuinely didn't know what the market was like or didn't know how to invest, um, invest in like marketing or relationship building. So the go to market plan you can call it the business plan or you can incorporate it within the business plan, but it, this really helps one with the financial projections, um, which I put at the end because the financial projections at this stage are garbage, but it just shows the investor that you really understood what you're targeting, how you're going to try and hit it. What does that look like? Have you got any understanding of what your competitors are doing? Do you know how much they're charging? Is that going to be your key aim here? Like, are you charging less than your competitors? Are you offering better services? Or do you have access to people in areas that perhaps your competitors do not have yet? For example, high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals. Perhaps you've worked in industry, uh, you know, in the financial sector. So you're going to go directly to your ex-colleagues and say, look, I've worked with you guys before. This is the market. So you can tell the investors, look, I'm, I'm just hitting up my old colleagues. That's it. Um, so with the, then again, go to market, will then start to using a lot of your competitor analysis or your market analysis. And this is a little bit different. Your competitor analysis is genuinely who's in the space. And that includes people you really need to like, I've seen people that didn't do enough competitor analysis. They were looking at like the top dogs in the space and you're going, yes, you're not competing against them. You're competing against everyone else that has a similar idea to you with a slight twist. That's your genuine competition. And have you done the actual work or just like Google the top few pages and said, that's it, I'm done. Competitor analysis sorted. You genuinely need to know who your competitors are um, because the VC likely, if you've got the right VC, who's going to invest in you. Likely, chance are they've already invested in your competitor. The likeliness is that they've seen 12 other if not two dozen other um competitors similar to you so they genuinely you need to understand why you're different and that will also include the specific problem you're solving um i think somebody asked this question the thing that i see most people fail at is you know your product so well and you've seen your specific side of the market so well and you've talked to your five friends or your 10 colleagues who are also in the same market that you kind of have a myopic view of the landscape, what other countries are doing, who's trying to come in, not just what other countries are doing, but there's so much movement now within the web two space and the FinTech side where they are connecting crypto rails that you genuinely, genuinely need to spend a good, we used to do competitor analysis for the payments industry with like people who had been in industry, you know, like PayPal's and others, um, Stripe, Plaid, Plaid, for years and years and we still took at least six weeks to do this competitive analysis like really deep dive we spoke to market players around different parts of the world different sized businesses to understand okay i've understood my problem what's your problem and that problem is that you need to encapsulate in a very clear clean slide with then a solution and then your product and the solution has to include a little bit of a hint towards what the revenue model might look like because otherwise that's not a solution, it's a hope, it's a hope. We would like to help you with this. Um, solution is this is this, this is this, and then open up with the product and say, this is the product, which encapsulates the solution for A, B, C, or D, depending on how many things you're solving, 
is it B2B, is it B2C? And then again, this will go into the business plan, which is based on competitor analysis, market analysis, our hope to go to market plan and the team's you know, acumen, business um, relationships, existing relationships. This is how we'll approach this business plan. Again, add KPIs, include what you would like to see, the kind of partnerships you would like to see. How are you going to plug yourself into the network? Again, this space is specifically focused on decentralization, which means that it is plug and play. It is modular. How are you going to be part of this modular landscape? Or are you going to be in one vertical or are you going to be a horizontal? Which means, okay, back to the go to business, go to market plan. Who are you going to target? Like genuinely. And again, if you're B2C, that's going to be very difficult. So you have to think, what can I partner? Whom can I partner with? Whose clients I can tap into organically and will get genuine traction because I'm not paying marketing. They're just plugging me in. And that's it. I now have access to X, Y, and Z pool of customers. If you're doing B2B, again, it sucks. Um, but, you know, we did a crowdfunding. It sometimes was difficult because you'd have one client you really loved. They're only fundraising 150K. You have another client, same amount of time, and they want to fundraise 500,000. You know, we charge a percentage of the total. The amount of time and hours we spent with each is the same sometimes more with the smaller clients because they're so nervous it's the first time they're getting such a large loan so it becomes a cost benefit analysis of is this client worth it in the long run and how much are they costing me at this in this moment per hour so again that will include things that you really want to include are in your analysis are you know ltvs cac your churn how sticky are you going to be and again this will go back into the go-to-market how are you going to be sticky? Does that mean you're going to plug in with somebody that's existing? Or are you going to just have such a great product that everyone's not going to leave? They're going to use it regularly. Um, you have to explain the customer lifespan number. I think it's really important because so many people get customers and they drop off after a month because the traction just doesn't go. So how are you going to genuinely convince the investor? So again, at a pre-seed, this might be a lot and this might seem like a lot, but if you can at least suggest to the investor that you've thought these things through. You're not just saying, we've got a problem, we've solved it. Great. What does that mean? Like, how does that look like? What? How are you going to grow? Like, If I give you money now, how are you not going to lose it, basically? that That's what they need to know. And the more of this you do for them, it means the less homework they have to do. So the more likely that they will just heads down. Like, for example, if you give them, oh, these are our highest profitability drivers, and these are the markets and the, you know our customer audience that we're targeting um and this is how many we would like in our pipeline by year end of one year end one then that means that i actually can go back to my team and say guys i'm going to do you know our in investment memo these are the expected numbers do i believe them they've given us a competitor analysis do i believe it does it have enough like references to like mckinsey or others that i would reference myself yes how comfortable do i see do i feel with their market analysis is there TAM the world? Is there TAM genuinely EMEA? Is there TAM Europe? Or is there TAM genuinely, you know, developers worldwide, predominantly English and, I don't know, Spanish speakers? You genuinely, the more specific and the better you can be. You can obviously, everyone knows that this will change, but it means that you have something that you're aiming for. So again, the more you do at every stage for the investor to convince them, the better. Don't put this all in a in one slide. Keep your, especially at pre-seed, keep it very simple. If you think that maybe your idea is complicated, add alternative decks that say, look, break down analysis of the market in the data room, break down analysis of the competitor analysis in the break room, break down projections and assumptions in the break room. The more you can, you know, just keep it clean so that they can also then share, VCs will share pipeline and deal flow with other VCs the better that they can do. And if you do want to show, hey, look, I've done all the heavy lifting for you, then brilliant, allow them to access it, but don't completely, you know, word bomb it. Again, it's like dating. You don't want to tell them all your secrets. You don't want to say, hey, I want kids on the first date. But you do want to know exactly that you're dating somebody that's dating, you know, for the long run, or if you're just flirting kind of thing. I think that's probably a good analogy, I'd say. 
Um, if not, then yeah, <laughs> crucify me later. Um, seed stage, again, we would expect a live product, functioning products. Hopefully it's already been plugged into a few, if it's B2B into one or two minimum clients that are showing traction. Um, we usually, at least that I've seen, a good sales team or a business development person, somebody that can make me feel great. You've now, you know, you've done the basis, the foundations are there. How are you going to grow it? Great. That's the team. Okay. Do I trust it? No. Yes. How are you going to convince me that that team is going to take it from A to B? Maybe it's not BD team that you need at that moment, but maybe it's somebody who's a legal advisor, regulations expert, AI expert, but they will then, you know, use their network as well to grow it. So the seed, you need to be showing me how you're going to grow. Why do you need my money? Because that pre-seed, you haven't done enough to like grow. What's the point of me giving you more and doubling down on a mistake? In essence. So again, the go-to-market plan, that will change depending on what you've learned. Again, be very, if you want to be honest, be very honest. We've learned, we've pivoted, we've decided that competitor analysis, now that you've grown, now that it's been a year or two, how much has the competition changed? What does that look like? Again, update the market analysis, update your business plan, um, update your financial projections. So most VCs, again, ask for three. It's unlikely the last for five years because again, it's it's just too much um, assumptions for five years. LOIs and MOUs. I've seen more and more VCs request this, including ours. LOIs, letters of intent or memorandums of understanding. What does that mean? It means we want to see that you've done the work at your pre-seed level, which is you've gone and you've sourced clients. And this is primarily for B2B partnerships. If you are B to C or if you are B to B to C, again, it's always good to try and uh, you know be lazy, cut corners. If you're B to C, find a partner that will sign up with you that will let you access their clients, because at the end of the day, it will you know it's it's a partnership of symbiosis. You access their client pool, they access your product. They don't have to take it in like in house. Find a way to make that work cohesively. Um, I think series A plus, it's just a lot more work. There's a lot of documents. There's a lot of analysis. There's a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of FAQs, a lot of discussions. This will take you months and months. So do your work again. I'd say with pre-seed, it's hard to say timelines. I don't think I've been, I've been out of the space for one too many months now to say properly, but I'd say pre-seed could be anything from usually around three to five months seed three to six sometimes even eight depending on how complicated your product is and who you're accessing so and series a again usually you can do it depending on how much you're fundraising and how popular you are i've seen somebody that did a series c that was huge again that's not series a but it was done in two parts so you can do half at one point say pre-summer let everyone chill over the summer because let's be honest, everyone's in and out. So the lag periods are very, very strange. And then everyone comes back, you can finish the second part of the series A. Be sure to communicate this. Always be honest with your investors on how you're closing the round, how you're do structuring it. Um, I can't say how to structure it. Um, somebody recently asked me what's better if it's equity or token. I know that pure token Again, this comes in with do your VCDD. Pure token is no longer as um, popular as it once was. I think at the moment it's equity with C token, uh, equity with token, or just simple equity. It will depend, and again, on your investors, what they want, what they're expecting, and for you to have really good tokenomics. So if you don't have that, uh, don't bother, just do equity, and then maybe develop that into token warrants or something else further down the line. Um, I think for series A, I don't know if everyone is at this level, but again, product developments, this will include additional products that you see that you might need to bring to market, um, altering your existing products. What are you gonna be your key hires? And that includes maybe somebody from markets that's gonna take you from A to B. They previously did, you know, launched Revolut or somebody else. and. They're going to be expensive, but, you know, they're worth it because they have traction. They have key contacts. 
what are your new markets? And by new markets, it doesn't necessarily mean just within geographical markets, but it might mean, hey, I've realized that the insurance industry could actually use my products. Um, so we've been speaking in industry events and blah, blah, blah. So again, go to competitor analysis. What are your competitors doing? Can you improve your products? Can you branch into other areas? There are two types of ways of competitor um, approach. I can't remember what there's a third one, which I can't remember at the moment. Uh, again, update your business plan, financials. This should be much stronger now, and that should probably include five years at this point, five, eight, five plus. Um, partnership pipeline, client pipe pipeline, uh, growth requirements. And by growth requirements, I mean, are you now having issues with regulation? Are you seeing that there's maybe some GDPR or some other stuff? Do you Have you tapped into, grown to an area where AI now requires you to get legal advice um, has something gone wrong that you now need? This is a really big one. Um, do you have enough HR? And by things that it's gone wrong in HR, I mean, if somebody leaves the company, I remember we saw this, can somebody, do you have the right waterfall actions that if somebody leaves, they can't access and destroy everything because they've been upset, because they're pissed off? As soon as they walk out the door from your offices or buildings or, you know, remote working, do they log off? Do you log them off immediately? Do you have a backup plan? Where is that backup plan? How often do you start updating the backup plan? If something goes up, goes wrong, if you know if somebody has a mental health crisis, can you still access that information? If somebody is sick, you know, with the whole COVID pandemic, where is their stuff? Is it accessible? How do you access this? Like, do you have you know two person, uh, whatever I forget what it's called right now. <laughs> Uh, but it, it starts at that level. You start needing to make sure that you have the right team, the right parameters and the right safety barriers. Um, and then you start going into additional materials that the VCs might request, um, which can be anything, any frequently asked questions, any um, other materials that you might have to produce. So I think that's about it. If we go to the next slide. So how do you approach VCs? I think this is one that I get asked a lot. Annoyingly, warm introductions are your best friends. How do you get a warm introduction? You have to put in a lot of work. Um, if you're in London or if you're in key capital cities, go to events. You never know who's going to be there. Go to events, um, make friends. It's a lot of evenings that you're going to have to give up. And the more you give up in a smaller time frame, the more friends you make, the more you realize, okay, they'll introduce me, they'll do this. The space is amazing. Everyone is so helpful and so lovely. Everyone loves to introduce people. Some might scam, so be careful because some I've I've heard I introduced somebody to someone I met once or twice at an event, thinking that they said that they'd be a VC. I sent one of my project, one of my clients through, and they came back and said, We met them face to face whilst at this event in a different country and they asked us for 30,000 pounds to introduce them to VCs, not even to confirm whether or not they'd get investment. And it wasn't the first time that this client had come across the, uh, a similar kind of scam, I'm going to call it, because it is a scam. And I was just really disappointed. I spoke to the VC and I said, I thought you were a VC. And he said, yes, I am a VC. This is how we work. And I'm like, no, no, no. Usually you give the money. That's a VC. You don't ask for my clients for money. So do just people that you trust to, to introduce you, be careful. And if somebody is, you know, feels dodgy, sadly, the space can be a bit. So ignore it, move on, be polite. It's a small space, but don't burn bridges, but also walk away politely. Uh, go to hacker houses. A lot of VCs either are previously hack, previous prior hackers um, if they're not, they might know VCs that might be interested in your project. So go to relevant hacker houses. If you don't think they'll be relevant, go for the fun. You never know again who you'll meet. Uh, conferences, great space. You don't have to get the tickets. You can go to the conferences sometimes. And there's so many side events that then people will invite you and it snowballs. But it is so much work. It is five days of exhaustion. Go say goodbye to your friends and family. Tell them you'll see them at the other side of the tunnel and just network like no one's business. Again, meetups are great places to meet people. You do have to go consistently. I've gone to some which are great. I've gone to some which are garbage, um, especially when it's raining like it is in the summer. 
and you've gone to an event and it's garbage. But go, you never know who you'll meet. And then the last but not least, everyone gets everything on Telegram. It gets very noisy very quickly. It got so, especially after conferences, it got to the point where I had anything between 350 to 600 messages. Sometimes it's not that we're ignoring you. It's just that you get lost in the deluge of things. So email, old school email, very clear, very polite. Don't nudge on a weekly basis, maybe nudge every two weeks. Um, and yeah, then try and see where they might be at an event. That's, that's it for me. I think I've rambled on enough. Can't feel my throat anymore. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, we have one question for now. So, um, so earlier you mentioned about um, what to include in the slides uh, when someone's looking to fundraise. So where do you often see people going wrong, like especially with their pitch deck or their slides? Like, you know, any tips for that? Yeah, I think I, I, I briefly covered that before. It is genuinely that they don't understand how to present the problem or the solution. And by solution, it doesn't mean, hey, this is what I've built. This is the specific problem that I'm solving. It is very much, this is the product. This is how I'm going to grow it within this market specifically. You need to know that we see so many as VCs. Well, we, we, I used to see so many decks where I genuinely didn't understand the problem or the solution. And I was like, I don't see how this is relevant. And then when people would come to me, the solution seemed that it was relevant to only the few thousand people genuinely within the crypto space. So you need to start branching out and not just using active wallets numbers as a as a good ROI or like measurement of anything, because that means nothing to me. I need to understand how are you going to grow, where are you going to grow, who are you targeting, and then that will make me feel more comfortable to give you money because that's where usually people go wrong. They put in so much information that's irrelevant because you know the project and this platform and the space so much. You need to take a step back. And again, this comes back to who's your VC? Who are you pitching to? Are these people in industry where you don't need to dumb it down? Or are these people who are not in industry, but you really want them on your cap table because they're great, because, you know, insert reasons. So you do, that's where people normally fail is one they haven't got the right information down, specifically the solution. They haven't addressed their, their markets clearly. They haven't shown me how they're going to grow clearly or in a way that I can convince that I, they know they, they know what they're doing. Um, and then secondly, they've come to me not understanding my thesis. So perhaps if I'm quiet, I've had that with one client. He was like, oh, they were so quiet. A few VCs are too quiet with us. I'm like, yeah, because you're not explaining it right. And, or you're going so deep into the tech because Web3 is so new, really, for a lot of people, that they don't feel comfortable enough to ask the right questions, which means you then have to take a step back and dumb it down. So be very careful who you're addressing. I hope Perfect. that answers the question. Yeah. And uh, we have another question. Do we need white paper or light paper at pre-seed stage to get investment? Um, it depends on how complicated your um, platform is or your product. Uh, it depends on, I'd say, yeah, it depends usually how complicated it is and whether or not you think it will aid the deck. If it's better, uh, remember, so many people give white papers, and if they're longer than eight pages, it's unlikely we will read them. We'll just skim through sometimes, mainly just jump to the conclusion. Um, so what I would do is, you know, remember, VCs get hundreds of these a year, if not. I remember one weekend I had to go through at least 50 just to catch up on, on some. So do a white paper if you think it's necessary. Um, do a white paper if you think the VC will appreciate it. Or otherwise, just do an alternative deck with simple stats, simple, you know, representation of what you're trying to get at with your white paper. And again, link in your financials, because at the end of the day, you need to tell them how they're going to exit in five years or 10 years. And again, sorry, that is important. You need to know how your VC is going to exit. So you need to tell them, they will probably ask, hey, so if we invest in you, 
in five years when we need our money out, what are you gonna do? And you need to think of that. So again, um, the answer is, I don't know. I, I wouldn't bother unless you really think it's necessary and unless the VC asks, asks for it. Perfect, thank you. And one last question, because I know Tatiana, you have to also uh, run off. So um, can you give an example, including numbers, multiples, et cetera, of how providers of finance would value the business being pitched? Sorry, can you repeat that question or can you? Oh, so um, can you give us an example of how uh, the provider of finance or so VC would value the business being pitched? Like how do they put a, um, a value measure um, or projection? Um, On the is... valuation of the company. Usually the valuation of the company or how they see it measuring up to competitors will depend on what projects they're seeing and what they've invested in and at what valuation they've seen those projects. So again, I think it's kind of like going to a marketplace. If if there's a year that, you know, there is a bountiful, that there's bountiful, um, I don't know, apples or something, and you bring a different variety of apples, you're just going to have to compare yourself to the rest of the market. It doesn't matter whether you think that actually you deserve more. The investor is going to say, yes, but I also have another apple who's giving me for less. Why would I pay for yours? So it, it is very much market tactics, marketplace tactics. Um, sometimes it will be based on what they see, but primarily it will be based on the lead investor. And the lead investor will be somebody like Andrewitz and Horowitz um, or Bevan Howard or somebody larger. So Walmart's even in this space now as store eight. If they'll have a team that will do their projections, their their financials, and they'll use different types of information, and then they'll give you a valuation that they think is done based on whatever key metrics they're using to evaluate you. And then everyone else in the in the fundraise will have to agree to that term, that value. So that's usually how it's valued. It's it's usually in consensus with others and the other investors. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Tatiana. I think that was a great insightful session. Um, and also, I, I know, um, you know, uh, you took time out to help us out as well here. Uh, in the video schedule, so thank you so much for that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining everyone today. And if you have any questions, do join our um, Crypto Mondays Academy telegram group. Um, and then you can also share your questions there. And uh, Tatiana very kindly uh, also shared uh, the email and her LinkedIn as well to get in touch. Uh, but yeah, we just want to say uh, thank you all for taking time to be here. And also, uh, once again, a big thank you to Tatiana for helping us out. And uh, see you all in the next IRO event next Monday. It was my pleasure. Everyone, Thanks. bye. Lovely to meet you. Bye.